Welcome to the Motion Podcast, your weekly discussion of motoring news. This is episode 588 on Tuesday, the 23rd of July, 2024. Hello, I'm Andrew. And this week, unfortunately, Alan cannot make it to the internet to join us on the show. I will crack on. I will be seeing how the summer holidays have already started for the car makers' PR departments. In new new car news, we note some OEMs are stepping back from their EV timetables. And in points of interest, we find out what a wonderful pair in car and architecture can be. Well, as I not so subtly hinted at there in the introduction, there is a limited amount of news this week, as the summer shutdown obviously has started. But there is something coming out of Renault, which is that that Philip Kreef, who is working at Alpine, is going to become the chief technology officer for the whole of the Renault group. He will do that as well as what uh, his duties are within the Alpine brand. And he's going to take over from Gilles Leborn, who has been appointed to a strategic advisory role to the CEO, according to this Yahoo Finance article we have linked in the show notes. Luca De Meo, who is the CEO of Renault Group, went on to discuss how his experience as the director of engineering at Ferrari was key, and he mentioned about how motorsport is a key element for them as an organization to uh, help develop technology and then bring them to the roads uh, for us mere mortals who drive the cars on the roads. I'm not sure what this will mean and how it will impact what Alpine is doing and how that is passed out throughout the group. But there's obviously some plans afoot, so we'll have to keep an eye on that one. Sticking with Europe, but this time going to the whole of it, because the EU has brought in new tyre safety rules. This is well, partially to do with the wet braking standards. What the EU now requires is that the wet braking capabilities of a tyre must be the same new as it is down to a 1.6 millimetre tread depth. Part of the hope of this, not only will that mean that tyres are safer, but it'll mean that people hold on to their tyres on their cars for longer. Because typically, um, in a study that Michelin, the tyre manufacturer, undertook, they found that 50% of tyres are removed before the tread had worn down below 3 millimetres. There's obviously quite a lot there left. If you ensure that the safety standards are the same at 1.6 millimetres, you've got a lot more wear left in those tyres. And uh, Michelin then, from this, estimates that 400 million tyres will then not need to be removed or won't be removed prematurely, which will result in the excess CO2 production of 35 million tonnes. That won't happen as a consequence of that. There's a new measuring stick that Evo have given us. That 35 million tonnes of excess CO2 production That is, and I'm quoting here from the article linked in the show notes, similar to the emissions from New York over a six-month period. (laughs) What a fantastic way to now start measuring emissions. How close it relates to what New York does. (laughs) No one is sure whether these rules will come into the UK because we don't automatically adopt what Europe is doing, as was demonstrated with the general safety rules to the other week. Uh, However, if you do see a new tyre sold with EU labels, and it has a four-digit code that shows that it's been made very recently, then you will gain the longevity benefits. Also, there is discussion about, oh, whether this will increase the cost of tyres, and it's, it's bound to, absolutely bound to, because of the the extra standards that these are going to. Plus, because of these extra standards, the their knock-on effect to the tyre manufacturers, which means they don't sell quite as many tyres. The prices will go up. Joy. But we'll be safer on the road. That's good. Okay, I'm going to bring us back to the UK, and I'm taking us to Lidl. Not the random aisle, though. We are going to stick with the car park because they are enabling EV charging payments via their rewards app. They're the first supermarket to do this. They have roughly 370 charge points um, and this in across the UK, of which around 300 are rapid chargers. They will be taking over from Podpoint, who currently run the charging network 
that Lidl uses in their car parks. I think it's very interesting that supermarkets have discovered that this is a potential income stream for them. I would imagine that one of the next things that will happen is that car car parks for supermarkets will follow akin to how France is now requiring, and that is that solar panels will be fitted over the top. This will have benefits not only to the supermarket because they'll be able to generate some of their energy via this method, but also uh, on hot days, if we ever get any in the UK, I, I, um, we've had two up here in t- Grim North, but if we get more hot days, then obviously parking underneath solar panel canopies will keep the cars cool, which will require less energy to blah de blah de blah This is all very good. Interesting that little are the first to do this. I would imagine the others will follow suit shortly. Moving on now, and we go to London, where Arriva buses have ordered 51 electric double-deckers from Volvo buses. It's the first time the BZL electric chassis has been uh, bought for those uh, who are operating for Transport for London. And the 51 buses will work on the 243 and 341 routes. (laughs) I don't know where they go or how long they are, but that's a lot of buses for two routes. Technology-wise, they are going to be fitted with the maximum 470 kilowatt hour battery packs. They will be able to charge via a cable um, of up to 150 kilowatt DC, or via OpCharge, which is a system that charges from the top of the vehicle a bit like the, the easiest way to describe this is a bit like it was a tram system where the, you're you're connected up to the electricity above or a you know electric train there's a, a section on the roof of which the charger then connects to and that can charge up to 300 kilowatt there is no confirmation on how these buses will be charged and they'll be located at the Tottenham depot and they'll be delivered from 2025 excellent I'm trying to dial down the sarcasm, but look look at London once again. <laughs> However, they are the biggest city, and it is a good thing that non-internal combustion engine buses are being put onto the roads there, so that helps to maintain and improve the air quality for everyone living in or trying to get around London. Now we move to Wales, and this is the news following an audit by the Welsh government that the TVR factory not actually being opened and used in Wales could cost the Welsh government a few million pounds after all it did to try and entice TVR Automotive to make that the area for car production. They spent £4.75 million buying the site. They then spent another £7.6 million on refurbishment. They also gave TVR a £2 million loan and invested £500,000 in the business. They got the loan back plus uh, interest, even though it was late repayment. And now TVR are looking at a site in Hampshire as possibly the place where it will build, allegedly build, their cars. Dear. That there will be a loss is if the Welsh government can sell the. Uh, the site at market value of about 7.5 million. So that would actually net a loss of 4.85 million to the taxpayers. But the officers involved from the government were warned not to refurbish the site before TVR hit the requirements that it needed to. Um, But the government said that they would go on with it anyway. Hopefully that site can then be sold or used by someone else, and then that brings jobs to the area. The fantasy of TVR Automotive just rolls on and on, unfortunately. Okay, that brings us to the end of the first part. You know, I wasn't kidding that there isn't much news this week. And that means it's Guilt Minute. It's the quick break in the show where we ask for a tad of financial support to keep the lights on and the hosting running. If you feel that the Motoring Podcast is worth a small consideration every month, then you can become a patron. Different levels of patron include different levels of commitment from us to you, including being able to watch the show recorded live. 
We also have a small range of merchandise in our spring store, from stickers to mugs and t-shirts. If you don't have any spare cash, and we completely understand that, then you can help us by following for free from a podcast player to receive every show as they are released and by liking and rating the show in whatever way your podcast supplier lets you. If you've done all that, and some of you do, so thank you very, very much, then the last thing you can do is recommend us to your friends or colleagues. Okay, I now leap into new, new car news. And here we go with naming. It's Audi. The new A5 has been revealed. We have to remember, odd numbers are the internal combustion engine varieties. Therefore, the old A4 is now an A5, and the even numbers are EVs. Right, hope that's clear, because even Evo in this article get confused themselves. There will be a new A5 X A4 uh, saloon and estate. This is the first of the next or last probably, generation internal combustion engine models that is going to be launched uh, up to 2026. And this is going to be 67 millimetres longer and 13 millimetres wider. So that's quite large. It must must be larger than several versions of the older A6 generations. However, they claim, and it's all in this Evo article linked, that the Redesigned body follows the themes from the A6 e-tron concept, and there is more muscular surfacing uh, and a relatively shallow glass out so that we get less glass, more metal. Oh, goody. There's also some tweaks to the front end, although I think it's pretty much blink and you'll miss it, uh, as well as round the back. Uh, Inside has been uh, greatly updated and is now much more modern feeling, um, and by that I mean there is a ton of screens everywhere. Goody. The pricing hasn't been announced, but the expectation is the saloon will cost from around 42000 and the Avant, which is the, what they call the Estates, if you weren't sure, that's an extra 2000 ish on top. And there will be an S5, um, which will apparently come with 362 brake horsepower, uh, as well as an S-Tronic dual-clutch transmission. Uh, because that helps to reduce the weight over the front axle, and there'll be the Quattro system um, for putting the power on the road, and expect the 0-62 to time to be just below 5 seconds. That will cost in the region of fifty-five to £60,000, though. For the rest of the range, that will have a mix of petrol and diesel engines, as well as a mild hybrid and a plug-in hybrid which will come later which will be powered through front or four-wheel drive options depending on the specs okay i'm going to move us on to vans now an electric van renault and the traffic e-tech this is their mid-size van is now going to be a full ev version and it will come with a price tag of 34,500 plus vat This will have a maximum range of 186 miles. It will enable 50 kilowatts DC charging, and that apparently gets the battery fully recharged in about an hour. There are two body lengths, so there is the 5 meter and then a five, nearly 5.5 meter, two heights, which is just under 2 meters and then just under 2.5 meters. And long wheelbase versions can carry loads up to 4.15 meters long. There will be a towing capacity of up to 920 kilograms and a maximum payload of up to 1,222 kilograms. Now the range on this, I'm not sure because I do, I'm I haven't been able to find out how EV ranges are calculated via WLTP with uh, vans on the commercial side of things, but it's uh, of up to 186 miles, so I don't know whether that is laden or unladen. So if you're in the market for an electric van, you need to check that out and understand it because you do not want to be purchasing something that isn't that doesn't meet your needs because they're they're not cheap, but you know nothing is cheap now. With pricing that 34,500 uh, plus VAT, is after the plug-in van grant 
If you want to go for the long wheelbase with the low roof version, that's a thousand pound more. And with the higher roof, it's another thousand pound on top of that. There's a reason that EV van take up is so low. One is cost and two is the capabilities of the technology at the moment. And they're just not hitting what many need them to do, which means that they then don't trickle down to uh, the rest of the market in the second hand because there's not enough of them being passed on. If you have a, as we say, usually with all these things, like we do with the lorries as well, if you have a central hub and you have a fixed area that you cover, then this could work for you. But it really becomes very niche in who can take advantage of, of such, of such vehicles, uh, rather than how a, a van can cover so many, uh, you know, an internal combustion can cover so many, but that will improve as the technology improves. Now to some not great news from Volkswagen, and they have announced that they will be postponing the ID Golf launch until 2029. This is to be based on the new vehicle architecture called SSP, but that is encountering some delays. Partially, this is to do with Cariad and the software side of things, which is really hampering the group as well. And whether the partnership that was just announced with Rivian is impacting this. There is talk about utilizing their software and the integration and um, the, the software stack and all these other terms. But we don't know whether that is, is changing things or how that impacts or whether this is all just down to problems they're finding with trying to bring out a completely new architecture. In the meantime, they will be bringing out the MEB Plus platform, which is uh, building on what is the current electric platform, the MEB, and you see that in some Fords as well as uh, obviously the Volkswagen Group. And the first of those models are due to arrive in 2026. It's not clear because this is all sort of, oh, we've sort of said this, not really said this. A lot of hearsay stuff coming about it because it, and it's uh, in an Electrive article that you can read as ever linked in the show notes, which is taking information from a German manager magazine. And it is not clear whether other models that were due to come out, um, such as Trinity, are still going to come out in 2028, or whether they've been impacted by this delay that's uh, hitting the ID Golf, or even if they are coming out, are they coming out as mass models, or is it a limited production run? There's so many ifs and buts still going on with this, Overall, it's not good because they'd only just announced that it was going to be launched in 2028. Mm. Really uh, hard times for Volkswagen. And plenty will say that they're self-inflicted and their own fault. Forgetting the Dieselgate side of things, the the mess with Cariad and platforms and stuff like that is because of past decisions by other senior execs who are no longer part of the company. Because it, it is clear there was a lack of understanding of a what software is about and how to do it, but also the the ramifications of getting that wrong, um, and but also shows how and why car companies try to move slowly is because these are really expensive mistakes to make. Ah, oh dear. We will obviously be keeping an eye on that and updating as more information comes out about the SFs platform and what timescales there are and what it all means to the company. There's yet another mess for them to clear up. They're not the only ones who are having to delay things. Uh, Ford is, has come out and said that the aim for going all electric in Europe by 2030 was too ambitious. The chief operating officer of the Model E electrification division has been speaking to Autocar and and he's quoted as saying, I don't think we can go all in on anything until our customers decide they're all in. And that's progressing at different rates around the world. Well, yes, it will. Um, on top of which, something we, t we talk about what every month at the moment is there is a cost of living crisis. There are huge inflation jumps all across the world, which is causing people to not be able to buy expensive, shiny metal things. That's just the way it is. That is not to say, and, and just to reiterate, I'm not one of those that says that EV sales are cratering or anything silly like that. They are still going up. They are just not doing the hockey stick rise that many thought 
than he foolishly thought was going to happen. Um, however, they still rise. They're still going up. It's just the whole car industry is being hit. No one is, is buying massive amounts of all cars. Those who are choosing to buy a car are being very, very selective in how they go with it. And this comes on the back of Audi's delay, uh, slowing down there or announcing that they're slowing down their electrification. You have Mercedes uh, in the last couple of weeks saying that they're investing millions into hybrid tech. This puts into perspective the valuation of the Renault Geely Aramco joint venture, Hawks, and it being allegedly worth $7.8 billion. I wonder whether how the actual market is will influence or cause changes to any uh, European, including the UK, government's stance on requirements per year of EV sales or zero emission vehicle sales. I and mean, we've just had it announced that Labour have decided that 2030 is the, is the cutoff date for new internal combustion engine only vehicles. We've yet to hear on hybrid side of things. However, when you look at the market and you look at the increasing calls from within the industry to help private side, of, to stimulate a private uh, market, you wonder whether they can actually manage that or whether the government doesn't change that and therefore the industry has to self-regulate that by just throttling what it will sell to anyone in terms of uh, options. Obviously, we will be keeping a very close eye on that here at the Motoring Podcast and we will keep you updated on that. That brings us into points of interest finally, and we start with a lunchtime read. And okay, I need to make this clear. Alan isn't here, but Alan put this in as the lunchtime read. I do not want to be thought of as the person who's just gone, oh, he's not here. Great. Let's put in an Andrew article. If this is not me. I didn't do this. This is Alan. This, this is an older article, but it is titled The Battle for Control of the Dashboard and is essentially telling you the story and the ins and outs of what's going on behind the scenes with cars and who is trying to win the battle for all the screens in your cars, who is going to control the infotainment screen, and in some cases, all the screens in your car. It goes to sort of map out, and it, like I say, it's a little bit out of date in certain areas because things have moved on since this article was written, particularly with uh, Apple CarPlay and their tie-in with the likes of Porsche and Aston Martin, but also with Android Automotive and how they're doing things. This is a great primer on where we are and where we're going in the short term with all this, um, without without trying to say who's good or bad or anything, but just pointing out who's doing what, why they're doing it. Anyone who's listened to the show for a long time, or even recently-ish, only recently, will know my thoughts on uh, software in cars. Okay, I'm now going to take us onto the list of the week, and it's another great one from Autocar, and it is titled, The Craziest Concept Cars Ever Made. There are 55 slides here. Yeah? And this ranges from the 60s all the way through up to the 2010s in terms of mad, insane, fantastical and wonderful concept cars. I am going to pick, though, I'm going to pick from 2000, the Citroen Osmos or Osmos. I See, Alan's not here to, to point out how bad my pronunciation is. But it is slide 34 for all those playing along at home. And this is <laughs> this is a marvellous early 2000s, late 1990s French concept car. Utterly mad. Wonderful photography. For, for some reason, there is a gentleman in a smoking jacket with some of the widest lapels on his shirt underneath I have ever seen. It is bonkers. But Citroen said that this was a bold concept which paints a vision of user-friendly vehicle design leading to a new form of relationship between pedestrians and motorists while addressing the issues of responsible car use. That could be done now. You could come out with a concept and use that statement right now and everyone would go, 
that's so progressive. So to have done this in 2000 is quite a thing. I think it looks fabulous. There's lots of glass, I think, to try and uh, break the barriers between when you hear what the, the whole concept was supposed to be about. But I think break the barriers between the people on the outside, uh, like the pedestrian, cyclist, etc., and the drivers on the inside, rather than where we go now to some moving tanks <laughs> where everyone is isolated and keeping people away and all the rest of it. There are no bad choices here. Each choice, each slide can be justified for a whole host of reasons. So do click through on this list. Do have fun having a look at some of the stuff, remembering some of the stuff that was a bit more out there than others. But that is a top list there from Richard Dredge and Autocar. I'm now going to round out the show with, and finally, and amazingly, The Guardian make this slot this time. And this is because they're discussing a book from architectural photographer Daniel Hopkinson and architect John Percy Holroyd. They have a, a book that's called A Time and Place, Volume 1, and this is where they have paired the European car of the year for the last 60 years with a building of the same vintage. You get this wonderful, <laughs> wonderful mix of of cars and architecture and buildings. It's just fabulous. It's essentially another list of the week, really. So you get a bonus list of the week as well. Uh, the book is £40 and it comes from The Modernist. There is a link in the uh, Guardian's article that enables you to go and buy it if you so wish. And some of this stuff is absolutely fabulous. I'm going to point out the rather marvellous 1969 photograph well it it's depicting 1969 is Preston bus station and a Peugeot 504 because the way they've captured it as well is just wonderful there's some great stuff in here do go click the link in the show notes read through and if it tickles your fancy or you know someone who'll enjoy it do go out and buy it as a present or something because this I love this sort of stuff where someone has had an idea like this and they've managed to execute on it because I know I'm nowhere near as creative as this and by any stretch of the imagination. I love seeing when somebody does do something like this. That's the end of the show and sorry it was just me. We did actually record an episode with Richard Gooding and unfortunately due to technical fault, um, I'm not sure where, but in the system somewhere has meant that I couldn't bring you his audio. So unfortunately you've missed out on his his insights, you've missed out on his knowledge, and he was on great form for this episode, which is, I'm so sorry that, uh, I'm so sorry to Richard that was effectively wasted his time, but I'm sorry that you've had to put up with just me this week. Uh, hopefully next week this shouldn't be a problem, but in the meantime, you can give us any feedback or share your thoughts with the show at Motoring Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. You can contact us via the Motoring Podcast contact page, which is the hub of all our activities. Remember, you can support us financially via Patreon, and please leave a review and rating on Apple Podcasts or however your podcast app lets you do such a thing. If you would like to get in touch with Alan, the best way to do that is via all the social medias that the over 35s use, where he is at AJP Bradley, that's B-R-A-D-L-E-Y. If you'd like to get in touch with me, if you search for Crack Windscreen on Twitter or Mastodon, you should find me. And I'm also on LinkedIn oh, under my real name. We'll be back very soon. But until then, I've been Andrew Clues. No one else has been Alan Bradley this week. And safe motoring. <laughs>